Well, I am here talking with Cora Norton, who released the fantastic album 19 last year. Cora, lovely to see you. You too. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, just, I'm very much looking forward to talking with you. Now, as I mentioned, 19 came out last year. Yeah. And by the time you, that came out, you already had a lot of streams on Spotify. So I'm guessing you have even more now. Yeah, look, Spotify's definitely been um, one of my kind of biggest outlets and, and something that I've seen the most growth in, which I think is really cool. Um, it's really, I think it's a great tool because people all over the world can listen to your music. And it's insane looking at the stats through Spotify and seeing people in countries that I haven't even thought of releasing my music to, streaming my songs. And I'm like, wow, that is insane and awesome, but insane. Um, so, yeah, it's been really nice to see how my music's grown and how how people across the world are seeing it. And, and 19 was such a special project to me that I'm just so glad that everybody got to hear a piece of it. I, it'd be great to find out, I suppose you could never know, but it would be great to find out how people in those other countries discover you in the first place, because that's so much of the mystery of it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've wondered more times than I can count how the hell somebody from literally the other side of the world has even heard my name, has found me on Spotify. I'm like, this is just crazy. But you know what? It's as much as the world is very, very big, it's a very small world with technology now, which is kind of nice in a way. Yeah. Cool. Um, and look, a lot of artists are releasing just singles uh, or EPs, but you went for a full album. Was, was that something you'd long dreamed of and you thought, I want to have this complete body of work and put it out? Or was it tempting to just go single by single? Because I think you released about four singles by the time the album mm -hmm. came out. Yeah, I released um, I released the fifth single just before just before the album came out, and um, the whole album thing was scary. A lot of people would call me crazy. I think I might call myself crazy. <laughs> um, you know, it's a lot of money to invest, and there's definitely a lot of merit in in releasing singles, um, just as they are. But I had I had all this stuff lined up. It was written, it was there, and I had the idea for 19 being looking back on my teenage years, and I think that it's really awesome that in five, ten years' time, I'm going to be able to look back and remember how I felt writing those songs, and I feel like the longer you leave it to record them or maybe you push them aside because they're not single material, um, you, kind of, you kind of lose that memory of them a little bit, and I think it's really nice that I have them there and I can absolutely always go back and listen to them and, and remember my life when I was 19. <laughs> have them there in one convenient package also you don't have yeah, to exactly, different exactly. files for them yeah, yeah. Uh, and you talked about uh, you just mentioned investing and it is these days something that individual artists take on a lot more far more than they used to there are a lot of independent artists particularly around the country music genre and associated genres and for you as a as a young person um, mm. starting out in your career that's a big decision to make so had you thought maybe you would like to get a, a label deal and went independent instead or how would you always planned to be independent look I, I never really thought into too much about how it worked um I just wanted to release music sometimes I don't know sometimes things just happen I've always been a kind of wing it person <laughs> um so when I started to record music I was like you know what if people like it I'll you know I'll release it independently if people like it if there's an opportunity there then sure but um I think I think that releasing independently is is pretty great actually um much as it would be of benefit to be on a label and if there's any labels out there listening <laughs> but look I I love that I I own all my music and that I can do whatever I want with my music and I I have that freedom to decide make all my decisions about my music you know I, I don't have somebody locking me in in contracts saying you have to release this at this time and I think it's really really nice that I just get to be myself and release what I want to release so yeah, and in terms of owning your own music, you wrote 11 of the 13 songs on the album. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would imagine that is something precious and you don't want to have to give up those rights. When did you write your first song? 
Oh gosh, good as question. in like first ever, not just first for the album. Yeah. Um. Look, I think I was doing a lot of dodgy songwriting when I was a kid. Um. But I would say the first song that I properly wrote and and sat down and said, okay, I'm going to write a song was probably twelve years old. And it's a bit dodgy. I'm not going to lie. But yeah. Um. It's definitely where it all started. Probably around twelve, thirteen. Uh, and by that stage. Um, and you would have heard a lot of music. So did you think, okay, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that song was verse, pre-chorus, chorus, verse, <laughs> pre-chorus, chorus, bridge, chorus. <laughs> so it was pretty much your standard. Um, that was way before I was even like listening to country or anything like that as well. So it was probably just kind of your standard standard pop song. It probably had your, your four standard four chords too. So... <laughs> Uh, who were you listening to at that stage? Oh, um, probably a lot of Ed Sheeran, okay. I'm thinking. <laughs> and then when you started listening to country, who were you listening to? Started with Carrie Underwood. Right. Um, I actually, I did, I always claimed I didn't like country, but every time mum and dad wouldn't be home, I, I would be listening to Gretchen Wilson in my room when I was like eight. So I guess it started there, but when I really started to get into country, I was... Um, probably 14 and it was definitely carrying Underwood Miranda Lambert type. yeah Gretchen Wilson's not really an artist I would have thought of for an eight-year-old but there you go you no always- no not at all <laughs> but something in her music spoke to you um, now you <laughs> became in, in more involved in music obviously you were listening to music as a child uh, and you referenced some perhaps dodgy songwriting when you were a child um, <laughs> but you became more involved in music when you had to stop cheerleading in 2015 and cheerleading was your passion but you had spinal surgeries which, which meant you had to give it away mm-hmm. um, you could have just felt sorry for yourself <laughs> instead of but instead you found another passion so um, I'm interested in in because you were a young person and it, it is really easy to be defeated by something even the surgeries alone let alone that you had something you loved and you had to give it up. Mm-hmm. So did you just decide that you were going to forge ahead and, and find something else? Because that's clearly a lot of passion and commitment that you had to direct somewhere. Yeah. Look, I had started probably that that whole songwriting thing a little bit before um, cheerleading, my cheerleading journey had to end. So I was already kind of getting into music and I really enjoyed music, but I, I never thought of it as an option of something that I could genuinely do. And um, when I was told, you know, don't go back to cheerleading, it would be very unwise. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of just made the decision and I said, I'm going to give this music thing a real crack. I'm going to hope for the best, see what happens. And, and yeah, so it was kind of a natural progress from where I was that um, where I was already doing some songwriting and stuff before I left that I just felt like that extra energy needed to be redirected into music. Yeah, right. And so at that stage, were you playing an instrument or you were singing and writing? Yeah, so I was playing guitar from about, I did guitar lessons when I was like five. I was very dodgy. I could play like smoke on the water, <laughs> like every other, other, every other, every other kid. But yeah, I started properly playing guitar around 12 or 13 as well. And at that stage, did you have a, like a, a smaller person's guitar or did you go for the full adult? No, no. I had the, I had the kids guitar going on. Um, and then I got a pink electric guitar not too long after that and then discovered I was not an electric guitarist. (laughs) So I bought a little Taylor GS Mini and it was kind of where where things really began for me, you know. It was my first electric acoustic, whatever you want to call it, guitar that you could actually plug in and and perform. So when I started doing gigs at about 14, it it was the guitar that I brought along with me. It was the guitar that I was writing all my songs on. And, yeah, it's still still one of my favourites. It's still the one, the go-to when I'm writing a song. It feels right. <laughs> so why wasn't an electric guitar right for you? Um, I, I just think that singing and songwriting was much more my forte than, than guitar. I do really like guitar. I, I play guitar at all my gigs. I've gotten decent, I would say, at, at playing, you know, acoustic guitar, but I never wanted to be like a rock and roll electric guitarist and 
much as I love the sound of an electric guitar, I think I'll leave that to the professionals. <laughs> Your singing voice is really, really strong. So I imagine singing in front of a, an electrified band doesn't daunt you though, because you have that power. Do you have a preference as to playing with a band or playing you with acoustic? Mm-hmm. Look, I love playing solo. I, I think there is something really awesome about kind of being able to have a crowd in the palm of your hand and, and really listen to what you do on your own. Um, but there is nothing like a band show. <laughs> there, I, I don't think there is anything that I will ever love the way I love getting up on a stage and playing a big show with a band. So your song Lap Around the Sun, which is on the album, um, I think really encapsulates that feeling of looking forward and embracing things that come to you just to go back to what we were talking about with you redirecting your energy at a particular yeah. point in your life. Is that a philosophy you live by? Yeah, look, it, it's something that I've tried to live by, especially the last few years. It's been interesting, as we all know. Um, we've had our ups and lots and lots and lots of downs the last couple of years. But I think that just trying to focus on how to make what comes next better how to make tomorrow better than today and and how to look at the bright side of things has been something that I've tried to focus on in the last couple of years. I feel like, you know, if I hadn't, I'd maybe be down in the dumps at the moment. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I feel like there's a lot of great, wonderful things in my life that if I sat here and, and focused on all the negative, I'd forget about all the good stuff. And, um, yeah, I just feel like that wouldn't be fair on me or myself to focus on everything that's bad. So I made an effort, a conscious effort over the last couple of years to really focus on what's good and, and put my energy into the things that are good. Mm. I wonder also whether your early experiences um, with surgeries and things, which are very hard to deal with at any age and particularly having to give up something you loved, maybe trained you for lack of a better term in dealing with disappointment so that actually you can have that attitude of trying to make things better because you're you're better at dealing with exactly the sorts of disappointments that have come up over the past couple of years yeah well, look I've definitely had to learn resilience and I think that maybe I had to grow up a little bit faster than than a lot of kids my age had to at the time and you know, I've had four spinal surgeries now and many others in between since since then. And, um, you know, it's just something that you learn to deal with. You learn to play with the cards you're dealt, I like to say, is that, you know, this is my life. I don't get to change it. I don't get to go back in time and make it different. You know, this is my life. This is what I live with. How can I make it work for me? And if I didn't say that, then I would be in a much different place than I am today. Mm. And when it came to recording your album, I think you, um, you you had control of the process. And part of what's interesting is that instead of just fixating on one producer and saying, I want to go here, I want to go there, you actually worked with a range of producers. And so I was so including Matt Fell and Shane Nicholson. And I was wondering whether that meant that you were interested in having different perspectives on your music so that you didn't want just that one collaborator to work with. Yeah, definitely. Look, I'd produced stuff with Rod Motby, who was kind of the main producer on the album before, and he's so wonderfully talented. But I really wanted to branch out. I really wanted to see exactly what you said, other people's perspective on my music. And and I had, there was actually one song that I did two versions of on the album, Collateral, um, which one of them Shane Nicholson recorded and one of them Michael Carpenter recorded. And for me, that song was kind of more in the alternate market and I was like I would really like to see what someone who has a great name with alternate music can do with this song so I took it to Shane and he did an amazing job on it and when I was talking to Michael Carpenter about things that I want to record and um, I showed him collateral I showed him the acoustic version of collateral and I said look I've already recorded a version of this song but I want I had I had two ideas for it you know I had something that was really alternate kind of country and then I had this rock track in my head as well um and so he produced the rock track version of it and I wouldn't have it any other way you know some people like why would you spend double the money to have one song on your album twice and I'm like you know what I just I wanted to do it I wanted to see how it would turn out and 
I don't regret it. I loved working with each and every producer for different reasons. You know, they're all so talented and I just, I don't know. I just, it felt creatively right for me. So I did it and it worked out really well. And I'm so proud of the album that we all produced together. Well, and also it was your decision because it was your project as discussed, you're in control. And I, and you could look at it also, I guess, as having road tested those producers for your next album. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Um, so it was definitely good to see, you know, who you can kind of work with and bounce ideas off and, and what kind of comes out of that. So I've been recording some stuff for my next project and it's all going really well, but I definitely feel like 19 was a a good lead up to that. And, and it definitely helped me make some, some good decisions, I think. Uh, And you had Travis Collins and Bryce Sainty doing some backup vocals on that album or backing vocals, I should say. I was wondering if you've ever sung backing vocals on anyone else's tracks. No, no, I haven't done backing vocals. I did do a, uh, a little bit of a collaboration with, um, Beck Lavelle for her track Nervous Girls had a bunch of wonderful women on that track um, which I I believe was a cover of a song that was released a few years ago Um, and it's just such a great song that you know it was kind of a bit of a girl power song so yeah I was was really proud to be a part of that one it's not necessarily backing vocals but it is yeah a bit of a collaboration which I think is awesome. And I think you all recorded that after after the 2020 lockdown started from memory and you were all recording remotely and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. We all, none of us got to see each other while we were recording that. Everyone was on like a different side of the country or something, at least a different side of the state. And yeah, trying to work out how we're going to do this. <laughs> this was interesting. Um, but yeah, it worked out really well. It did. It's a great song. Uh, Now, speaking of great songs, your new single is Till We Drop, which is from your album. And it is a party song. Not all the songs on the album are party songs. Some of them are quite serious. Um, And I'm as in emotionally serious. I'm wondering if you thought it was a good time to release this because we kind of all need a bit of a party at the moment. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, look, I've been tossing up when to release this song. I always knew this song was going to be a single. It's definitely one of my favourites from the album. And um, we, we were kind of going through lockdown, oh, which lockdown, the yeah. last, the most recent New South Wales lockdown. Um, and I was supposed to release that single then. And I wanted, I had this great idea for a video clip that I was recording with electric light films up in Tamworth. And, you know, we, we couldn't do that. We couldn't travel to do the video or anything like that. And I didn't want to release this song half-heartedly. Um, it was a big party song. And as soon as we got out of lockdown, I was like, that's it. It's time to, it's time to party. It's time to throw out all the seriousness and, and do something really, really fun. So we recorded that video and, and, and did the photo shoot for that. And it was really, really fun and really awesome. And yeah, I'm so proud of this song. I think that it's, it's just, it's something different for me, I think, but yeah, I really wanted to go out with a bang. This is my last single from that album that I'm releasing. So I wanted to finish it on a high note. So I thought, what better way than till we drop? Indeed. Um, so will you have the chance to go out on a high note live with the song? Because I would imagine it's probably a good, like, last song of your set um, in yeah. that case. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, look, shows are still <laughs> being cancelled, left, right and centre. Um, but definitely when we kind of get back to things, it's going to be it's going to be a hell of a good live track. I did... Um, um, the country rocks festival at the end of last year and we kind of partied nice and hard down in Canberra and it was really really great so I can't wait to do more of that this year a festival gosh what's that <laughs> it's, it's like a foreign uh, foreign entity uh, and speaking of festivals though Tamworth uh with people still have time to plan to go because it's in April are you planning to do some shows there um look I'm opening for Ashley Dallas's show on the Saturday Um, but I don't have too much on at the moment. I'm kind of going to see if I can drop in for a few days and, and just enjoy my time there, go see some shows open for Ashley and, and come back. It's actually going to be in my, I think it's in my uni break. So it'll be very nice. I didn't realize you're at university. There you go. (laughs) I'm not yet. I'm starting in like two weeks. (laughs) Ah, that'll be fun. Hopefully you'll get to see people live in person. Yeah. (laughs) Cora, it was delightful speaking with you and um, 
because I'm a fan of 19. I'm very pleased to hear you're working on new music. So I hope that's not too far away. No, not at all. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you. Thanks.